Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ninth episode of Career Podcast. It's been 160 days since the last episode. I know when everyone has started their projects in the beginning of quarantine and they left it off. Well, it, it was the same with Career Podcast. So what can I say? Sue me. <laughs> it was around, it was May 25th when we uploaded the last episode, and here we are with Mr. Jeremy Nelson, a graphic designer, an independent brand, and identity designer for sport, fitness, and active lifestyle subjects and here's a fun fact mr nelson was originally supposed to be the first guest of the podcast but well i was busy sometimes and he was busy a lot of times but a lot of guests interesting guests came on so and here we are on the ninth episode so um i give a little, little introduction to our audience right now mr nelson and would you if i left anything up would you add on if I left anything off in the introduction about yourself. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. Um, glad to be on the podcast here and uh, excited to talk a little bit about design. Uh, no, I, as far as a general overview, that, that summarizes things pretty well. I'm an independent designer. I, I focus on identity uh, design, visual identity systems, particularly in the, in the industry of, of sport, fitness and active lifestyle. All right, and all right, we're just gonna go straight to the point. Give us a little introduction on how you got into graphic design. Like, when exactly was the trigger that you got interest got interested in it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think a, a lot of people in the creative field have uh, similar stories to some degree, and mine is is no different. There, I, I grew up. Uh, always liking to create things and uh, explore different different mediums of creativity. So drawing and you know just making making little things as a as a child, um, and that naturally evolved as as I grew up. You know in in school, uh, taking art classes and just you know exploring different means of creativity and so it was never anything that i saw as as something that i wanted to do as a career while growing up but it was always something that i enjoyed and always something that i found rewarding um and so eventually i i kept practicing kept doing it uh, whether it was again drawing or photography or, or any sorts of different creative mediums and eventually uh, you know, when you when you do something for long enough, you develop a certain a set of skills that that allow, uh, you know, new opportunities to open up. And so that's more or less what happened uh, in my case and eventually saw that it could become a career. Interesting. So. All right. Let me get this straight. Originally, you knew you wanted to become a graphic designer. So in high school or college, you didn't study another subject you just went to straight for graphic design and art is that no, correct no that's a, that's actually a really great question so actually um working in the sports industry that's where my other major interest or passion is um i love a lot of different sports and appreciate it for a lot of different reasons um and growing up sports was also a big part of my life i actually i played lacrosse and baseball the most growing up but lacrosse, which is a sport played here in America and the United States, and and actually it's it's played globally, which is exciting to to see that it's growing. But um, originally, it's it's from uh, the United States here. Anyway, it, it became a real real passion of mine in high school, and I played in college, and so I actually had interest in uh, moving into the. Um, sports performance training world. And so in, in essence, if you imagine, uh, you know, a coach who helps uh, athletes prepare for competition in their various fields. So I thought that that was actually going to be the career path that I would be moving towards. So when I went to school in college, um, I, I actually went in as a graphic design major, but I had plans to switch to kinesiology, which is kind of a uh, the, the study of the human body in various ways and um, how it how it functions and how it it uh, performs. Um, but as uh, you know, as as things go, I tried 
I tried some classes. I tried uh, tried out that direction, and even after completing my degree, I did an internship and took a few jobs in that uh, in that career direction. Um, and through that experimentation, found out that it was very much something that I that I enjoyed uh, more more as a personal interest, but not from a career standpoint. And so. Um, to get back to your question, uh, no, I actually didn't think that I was going to be moving into a career in graphic design, even though it was something that I enjoyed, but eventually over time realized that, uh, it, it had more interest. Uh, there was more interest there than I thought there might've been originally. Um, so yeah, eventually I circled back to it and, and uh, that's the direction that I've gone since. All right. Um, after the next question. So w we know the, that right now you're professionally a graphic, graphic designer right now, but what is your main branch of design in that sense? Like, what are you focusing on right now? And tell us, and, and I say the second part of to that question is, and tell us about your experience from the start of your profession till now. And by, by the way, by the branch of design, I mean like, uh, because I've seen your works, like you're really focused sometimes on typography. Like, of course, uh, the reason I even found your page and works is from Jaeger fonts, because I was looking for free assets for, of course, for my creative works. I wasn't, here's the thing that's uh, just a, a quick note for the audience. Like there are a lot of like free assets you can use online for your projects. But when it comes to like using it commercially, it becomes a different thing, you know? So if you, even if you're going to use it in your like passion projects and hobbies, always credit the creators of the assets, whether it's font, whether it's graphic assets, or if it's, if you're going to use it commercially, well, that's a different story, you know, but I just wanted to clear, you know, point that out and yeah, could you please tell us yeah, about your professions? Absolutely. And actually I have to give you a shout out. I really appreciate when, when you first reached out, um, a lot of people are glad to, um, you know, utilize some of the, the assets and, and fonts that I, I share, but it's always fun to see when somebody takes the time to share work that they've created using those. And so that's what I really appreciated about, about you is that you, you took the time to, uh, to share some of the stuff that you had made and, and that you continue to make, which is always for me, very rewarding to see other creatives taking what I've, uh, started whatever set of tools I share and then go out and make something new with them. So um, to uh, to explain a little further, yeah, I, I really focus on visual identity. And so within that, uh, even more so logo design and custom typeface design are kind of two areas of real interest for me. Um, I just find those to have a lot of uh, there's a lot of challenge within those uh, disciplines, within those particular areas, uh, but also a lot of flexibility. Um, and so, uh, yeah, does, does that answer your, the question? Is there anything between, between those two areas I can explain more if it'd be helpful? Mm, no, I think that's pretty much, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, yeah. That's it for that question. Um, by the way, folks, before we move into the next question, I'm going to put the link to the download of the Jaeger fonts if any of you guys are interested. So yeah, there's that. And we move on to the next question. Um, are you a freelancer right now or working in a particular studio? Um, give us your thoughts on being both a freelancer and working for a company, if you have any experience in that. And by freelance, I mean which websites also you worked, you know, all that. Yeah, yeah, it's just, that's a great question. Um, so I have a background working in house, both uh, at a company, at an agency, and I'm now independent. So, uh, you know, depending on how you describe the position, uh, you know, you could consider me both as an independent service provider or a freelancer. And by that, I mean that I work both direct to client and I also work for other agencies and studios within the industry. So, some of my work is is independent work that I manage working directly with the client and some work is contracted work to other agencies. Um, and I think both uh, both 
working in-house for another business or company uh, or brand or agency and working independently as a, you know, a freelancer or just a solopreneur, if you will, both have their advantages and disadvantages. And I think it's, it's easy depending on which side of the fence you fall to feel like the other option uh, could be more rewarding or hold more potential. Um, but I think both of them come with unique challenges. Um, and at the end of the day, it really comes down to the life circumstance and personality and individual preference that, that a person has in terms of the, the rhythm of work and life that they find most, uh, most appealing, um, as well as, you know, just kind of what sort of jobs they might want to pursue because there are certain opportunities that come with being independent that you don't see when you're in-house, but then there are other opportunities and benefits to being in-house that, that don't come when you're out on your own. Mm, exactly. And uh, on a side note, how about freelancing? How would you usually deal with bad clients? I mean, you know, the, the stereotypical cliche clients for graphic designers when they don't understand like the value of someone's work and like they say you can draw this in five minutes or they don't understand the, how pricing works, you know, you know, the whole package, but how do you usually deal with those kind of clients? Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for better or worse, I've, I've tried to avoid those kinds of situations as much as possible. And I think, um, that comes down to asking more questions at the beginning of an engagement than, uh, than just jumping into things quickly. I think a lot of those difficult situations can be avoided if you take the time to, to ask about the client's situation, what they are prioritizing, what they see as most important with a project. You know, if you ask a client what's important to them and, and, and they say that, that the budget is low and the timeline is quick, like they want something as soon as possible, well, you know, you just have to be aware of that and then make the decision as to whether or not it's it's a project that's really worth uh, your time and energy. And, and maybe it is uh, that that's the situation that um, everybody, I guess, has to navigate uh, on their own. And given whatever set of circumstances they may may be juggling at the end of the day, it's I think it's difficult to convince somebody that your work is should that it should be more valuable than they think it is because ultimately that's their decision and uh depending on their their business or the intended application uh the the actual value of the work you're creating may be more or less than you you feel it should be um let's see and uh did uh, i may not have completely answered there did that cover things i think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, it's it's a tricky situation, you know. Like, I don't want to give a one size fits all answer. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I think it really just comes down to a little bit of practice and and taking the time to ask thoughtful questions at the beginning of the process. Um, because there there may be times when you know uh, speed and efficiency uh, are important. Uh, but you can still provide a meaningful and valuable service. So it's it's really, I think, just about being aware and clear on kind of expectations at the beginning of any sort of project. Well, of course, the question was pretty general. There's a lot of like different situation that a designer or freelancer could be stuck in with a bad client. But yeah, I mean, that pretty much sums it up in a general answer yeah that's, that's good i'll say uh, I'll, i guess be before we move on i'll just say that like right. it is it is difficult because there are certain situations that you might not foresee or might not have the knowledge or understanding to ask about at the beginning of a project that come up halfway through um and and those are those are challenges and curveballs that you just have to navigate as best you can on the fly you know i'm i'm I've been doing this for a little while, but but I certainly have a lot yet to learn. And I think at this point, I, I still understand very clearly that there's uh, there are there are 
inevitably unknowns to every project um, that that you just have to adjust as best as possible on the fly to. All right. Um, so the next question, how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a design project? And that design project could be a typography project, could be a web development project, any project. Well, what is, what does your, how is your design mindset? How does your mindset work framework? You know what I mean? How does the process usually go? Yeah, no, I think this is, this is huge. And, uh, for me, developing a structure around my process has been something that I've been uh, continuing to refine and, and find more and more interesting because at, at the end of the day, you can, you know, anybody can get lucky and, and kind of create a, uh, a stunning piece of design work by accident. Um, but whether or not you can repeat that effectively in a variety of different circumstances or applications or situations, whether or not you can repeat that is is kind of what will dictate your long-term success as a designer. So for me, I think a, a lot of the process begins with asking the question, why? You know, like, why are we even doing this project? Why why pursue this? What What is the intended purpose of this design? You know, so if it's a if it's a personal project, why am I why am I taking this on? Am I trying to develop a new skill set? Am I exploring a new medium? Am I, you know, am I just is this purely for my own creative satisfaction? And any of those any of those reasons might be uh, might be valid or might be the right reason. But I think having a, a clear understanding of why you're doing what you're doing is really, really important because there are a lot of situations where you might, you know, you might be halfway through a project and you might be uh, confused as to what the best direction to pursue is or what, uh, how to move the project forward. But if you have a clear idea of, of the purpose of the project, what its intended use and function is, that can always be a guide and an anchor to come back to. Uh, so after after asking the question why, after establishing some sort of purpose and intention, I think research is is really really essential and really key. And research can come in a wide wide variety of forms, but I think ultimately that comes down to kind of gathering a, a body of of reference and understanding around the subject matter. And whether or not that's something you do online, digitally, or in physical form, or experientially through travel and actually going to places and speaking to people, um, I think it, it can happen in a lot of different ways. But I think research is is really, really important because the the depth of understanding that you can bring to any given subject matter will open up, uh, you know, a, a more potential for creative thinking and solutions that you may not have been able to come to without that level of understanding. All right. Um, so this is the question. The next question is the question I ask usually every graphic designer I have on the show. And, it, and the question is this, um, what do you think about the statement? you have to be good at drawing to be good at graphic design. I, I mean, I, to me, um, it's, it's interesting. I think there is a lot of value in having the capability of, uh, I, uh, of drawing, translating an idea into uh, visual form through, through drawing. But at the same time, I don't think it's I don't think you have to be good at drawing to be a good at, at graphic design. I think it's it's helpful. I think it's a very useful skill set to have and a very useful tool to have in your toolbox, so to speak. But I don't I don't think it's essential. So if somebody's worried that they're bad at drawing and they don't feel like they can be a good designer because of that, um, I mean, I, I would just I would encourage them to continue practicing as, you know, I, I don't think the value of drawing is uh, negligible, 
I think it's I think it's significant. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't want that mindset to hold them back in any sort of way. So I think, yeah, to anybody who's worried that their their drawing skills aren't what they want them to be, I would say don't don't sweat it too much. Keep practicing, um, uh, but and don't don't let it discourage you. Yeah. Um, any tips for a good resume for a design, up and coming designer? For example, should they update their LinkedIn or Behance? Or and a second part to that question is how to get your work noticed by big companies. Yeah, yeah. I think this is this is a really tricky situation in some regards and very simple in other ways. So I think my general recommendation would be, and and most designers have probably heard this, but you want to create and show the type of work you want to do more of. So uh, uh, that makes it sound very simple, I know, but in reality, that's worked the best for me in that I often, you know, I've, I've shared certain pieces of work, certain projects, and there's been, you know, interest from companies or individuals that's followed that's allowed me con to continue doing more of that work. So if you're interested in doing um, editorial and layout design, but all you're sharing is logo designs, then the likelihood that somebody will come to you and ask for, you know, a, a layout or editorial related design project, those odds are very low. So I'd say that that's one thing to think about at the beginning is just, are you showing the type of work you want to do more of? Um, and then also, I guess when it comes to positioning yourself and getting your work out there, I think the biggest question is who do you want to work with or for and how are those people engaging their industry and that those service providers. So this is where it comes down to, you know, the industry that you're focusing on or what sort of clients you're pursuing and, and how you can connect with them because for certain clientele, uh, you know, a, a platform like, Instagram or Behance or Twitter or, you know, a more um, broad social media presence may be most effective. But I've known plenty of designers and some of the most reputable people within specific industries who have minimal presence on social media, but are very engaged uh, interpersonally from a network standpoint and have built strong relationships that that keep opening up different opportunities. So there's not necessarily one specific way I think that works in all situations. I think you just have to ask the question, you know, how are these uh, businesses or potential clients finding and connecting with their their service providers? So that that's where it gets a little bit difficult to say because the strategy might be different depending on your situation and interest. All right, uh, on to the next question. Um, what are you working on right now that you can tell us? What project is it? And of course, I understand if it's something confidential that you can share. I mean, that that's fine. We'll move on to the next question. But um, if you could tell us, you know, it's just a, a miscellaneous question. It's not really, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, working with other studios and agencies, there's definitely a, a large portion of my work that uh, I can't speak directly about, which is just kind of it's just kind of the nature of how those engagements often work. Um, that being said, I mean, I can say generally speaking is still uh, work within the sports branding and identity space. So, um you know, these projects are, are fun, and, but they are often longer in, in duration and timeline. So sometimes it, you know, you may be working on a project and then it might, it might not be, it might not become public for a little while. So there's, there's stuff that will be coming out eventually that hasn't come out yet. Um, but independently, I can talk about, you know, projects that I'm, I'm working on. And like you mentioned earlier, typeface design is something that I, you know, have, have really gotten into over the past couple of years and continue to explore and refine over time. I mean, it's an incredibly complex and interesting discipline that I continue to learn about. But, um, you know, independently, I, I keep developing new fonts, new typefaces, and I've got 
some that are close to releasing, some that are just in their beginning stages, um, a variety of different styles and um, and looks. And so I think to me, that's exciting stuff to have on the side because when, you know, a client project or live work that I'm responsible for uh, has one sort of creative uh, load, if you will, you know, it, it, it takes a certain creative energy. Having an independent project to work on that allows you to tap into other creative areas or creative interests is always refreshing. So um, I guess be on the lookout. I'll definitely let you know as those those projects come out, you know, I'll definitely be sharing some of some of those new fonts, new typefaces, uh, you know, some of them for free, some of them paid options. And so um, that's something that I'm excited about and hopefully we'll be able to share soon. All right. And on to the last question. What area besides uh, right now you're working as a graphic designer, as you said earlier, and what area besides that would you like to explore and basically learn from in the future? Like what subject, what skill? Uh, so are you talking about a subject or skill outside of design or outside, or a subject or skill in design that's not within the industry that I'm focusing matter. on. It depends uh, on how much passion you're about it. If it's if it's, it's still inside design, but you're, that's the thing you want to, like your priority to learn on your free time, sure. And, or if it's outside of design, but you're more passionate about that, doesn't matter which one are you more interested in. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So I guess, and I'm not sure how much of this is the result of, uh, you know, the virus and kind of being not being able to travel as much, but I feel like um, traveling and getting a, a broader perspective and understanding of the world is something that I'm more and more interested in and more and more curious about. I think, you know, growing up, it's easy to, well, you know, growing up, you just don't have as as clear of an understanding of how expansive and diverse the world we live in is. And so to me, as I've gotten older and you know continue to learn and and get a get a better understanding of the world, it's been you know it's become clear that there's a lot out there that I haven't seen or experienced and and that's exciting to me and something that i'd I'd like to do more of and so by that, I guess I mean I'd like to to travel more um you know and whether or not that just means to to other countries to see different cultures and and worldviews and um you know, places, I think, again, from a design standpoint, too, uh, there's so much to be gained in seeing and experiencing different things. And so to me, that's something that is uh, intriguing and exciting, and I'd like to do more of. But at the the current time, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, At the same time, it's something that I I look forward to and and hope to uh, do more of. All right, now we reach to the final section of the podcast, which is the timeline section and conclusion. Um, with all that being said and done, to conclude all we discussed, give us a roadmap for someone who is zero in graphic design and basically wants to get to the place where you are in terms of skill set. Um, where to start? What are the best tools and softwares you use? Books, courses, anything you could tell us from like zero to where you are right now. Oh man, yeah, that's tough. I would say. Number one, I would say I would just encourage younger designers or creatives or whoever you are um, just to be curious and to be um, as confident as you can be in taking a first step. And by, by that, I mean, I think there are a lot of disciplines or skills or um means of creative expression that you might see out there in the world, whether it be in in physical form or online, that it it looks impressive, it looks appealing. But I think sometimes the reality of those disciplines might be different than it looks like or is presented as. So I would say um, as much as possible as as a younger designer, uh, try a lot of different things, you know, whether that's Uh, You know, again, traditional mediums, if it's drawing or painting or illustration or photography or film, I think a lot of those 
more fundamental creative disciplines can go a long way in terms of establishing a, a kind of a, a base foundational set of skills. Um, again, to kind of reiterate what we talked about earlier, I think drawing is a, is a basic skill that has a lot of value. I think um, an understanding of typography and layout and the arrangement of, of form um, in space. And I know that that sounds a little bit abstract, but but the uh, just the placement and arrangement of objects for you know a specific purpose or to communicate a specific message, um, those kind of fundamental skills can be transferred into a lot of different uh, disciplines and different areas. And so I think those are uh, definitely worth pursuing as a younger creative. Um, but at the end of the day, like I think it, it should be it should be fun and it should be rewarding. So as much as possible, stay curious, I would say experiment and try different things. And if, if something is appealing or rewarding or uh, energizing for you, then, then keep doing it. There's obviously going to be times when things are challenging or times when something's not coming as easily as you'd like it to. And, and that's just the nature of developing any sort of, of skill or talent um, so I would also just encourage you to try to stay consistent as much as possible. Don't don't think that it will happen in one day or one week or one year, even because any skill worth developing does take time. Um, I'd say as far as as far as resources or methodologies, I think what you would describe as master studies are, are a great approach when you're beginning to acquire a new skill set. And by master studies, I mean, basically identifying a leader or um, somebody within the skill set or field that you want to improve on, uh, identify some leader or somebody who's doing the kind of work you, you would like to do, and then do your best to replicate that. And as long as you're not you know, sharing that work and saying that it's your own work and it's your own idea. I think it's totally okay to copy another artist's work in the effort of, of gaining better understanding of that skill set and improving your own capabilities. Um, in fact, I think it's one of the best ways to do it. It's, uh, you know, it's an incredibly useful skill. And so as you do that and as you practice the discipline in its most basic forms i think your ability to match a creative vision with the final execution that you can deliver will slowly improve um i think uh, as far as resources <laughs> it might sound silly but but youtube is great um depending on what discipline it is there may or may not be more resources available there but there are tremendous number of, of really capable and, and skillful creatives who've been generous with their knowledge and time and share it on, on YouTube. And there are other platforms as well, some of them, them paid. But I think, I guess, for, for the global audience, YouTube is uh, helpful in that, for the most part, the information there is more accessible. All right. Um, thanks for joining us on the podcast, Mr. Nelson. And how can people contact you if they wanted, if they had a question about, about the stuff you said in the podcast or in general wanted to follow your works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the best thing, you know, you can find me on Instagram. It's my name, Jeremy Nelson 42. Uh, you can also find me on Behance, which I believe is the same thing. Um, and uh, I'm just checking it real quick, actually. No, so Behance is actually just behance.net slash Jeremy Nelson. So it's just my name. Um, and then if you want to email me, uh, you can find me at Jeremy Nelson Design at gmail.com. And those those three options are probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm on Twitter, but I'm I'm not very active there. So I'd say shoot me an email or send me a message on Instagram or D or Behance. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to talk or connect with anybody who's interested. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for your time and take care, people. Bye. All right. Take care.